it was explicitly created to be an antidote to increasing government control, increasing government intervention in the university sector. It was explicitly there saying governments are getting too much power and the fear is that this will lead to a uh, decline in academic freedom, free speech. Coming up on British Thought Leaders, James Tooley, Vice-Chancellor at University of Buckingham. James discusses the challenges of running a university that champions free speech. This is not a safe place. This is a place where you can have ideas that trouble you, that, that challenge you. Um, this is a safe place for debate, but not to avoid debate. He shares surprising research into private schools and the world's poorest slums. We don't have to have state education. We don't have to have government involved in education in order to deliver something that is high quality, of great value to parents. And in a school like that doesn't have to get caught up in the woke agenda either. Welcome to British Thought Leaders, I'm Lee Hall. Uh, today I'm sitting down with Professor James Tooley, Vice-Chancellor at University of Buckingham. James, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, can you tell us a bit about University of Buckingham, how it was founded and why it stands out? Yeah, it, it was uh, created uh, back in the 1960s, the idea, late 1960s, um, and then the actual university was created in the 1970s. It was explicitly created to be an antidote to increasing government control, increasing government intervention in the university sector. It was explicitly there saying governments are getting too much power and the fear is that this will lead to a uh, decline in academic freedom, free speech, as well as, uh, as, as other negative things. So, so there was this moral duty, as it were, to create a university that would be independent of government funding, and so they argued uh, independent of government regulation, and so academic freedom of free speech could, could thrive. And involved from very early on was one Margaret Thatcher. All right. Yes, she was on our um, uh, the Board of Patrons, it was called, from 1973. Um, and then when in 1976 we opened our doors to our first students, she gave the first matriculation speech, and a beautiful speech it is too, full of praise for um, the virtue of the virtues of independence and freedom. Independence, she said, is not something governments confer on a people. It's your birthright. Claim it. You know, it was a very, very rousing speech. So, so all that, all the, and then Margaret Thatcher then became our our chancellor, our figurehead, um, in 1992, to uh, when she had resigned from politics. And and so we we've got this tradition. It's quite hard to keep that going. It is hard to keep it going, but nonetheless, we are maintaining this idea that we are here. If any university, you know, if any university is going to be left that espouses academic freedom, free speech, and so on, it's going to be us. We are absolutely. It's it's, it's, it's written into our very constitution, in a sense. Yes. Brilliant. I mean, so there's only a handful of these private universities. What are the main differences? Well. On one level, our founders, they wanted this independence from government, no government funding, so no government regulation. Governments have reg regulate us almost as much as they regulate the other, un other universities. So this is, this is the negative part of the story, and it's something that I will want to be fighting and want to be um, you know, challenging. So we do have many regulations that are, are there um, which uh, uh, other universities have. But our, our, our major difference in terms of regulations is we don't have any, there's no regulation of our admissions policy, which is other universities, believe it or not, there are regulations of their admissions policies. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't have any regulation of our research output. And of course, we can charge whatever fees we want. Um, and actually, we're, we're, we're cheaper than other universities, but we could charge considerably more. Um, in, uh, if, if we wanted to, but so so, but the, the the principle is we don't receive government funding, and therefore we are to a greater extent than any other university independent of what government wants. But in, I, I realise actually the title of your series, isn't it, is is leadership or leaders, um, and 
having been the vice chancellor for just over three years, I recognise how important leaders are mm -hmm. actually, and that other people in the same position with the same university might not have stood so firmly because the the tide is turning against yeah. us, as you know. They might not have stood so firmly for independence and freedom and academic freedom and free speech. I have embraced those. They are the reasons why I'm in I'm at Buckingham. Um, they're the very reasons why I came. Um, others, you could see others might have, well, thought to resist the, the, the flow in the earth. The rest of the sector is not worth it. I'm standing out. And it's difficult sometimes. It's difficult. It is. Mm. I mean, to people not in the academic world, this idea of a lack of academic freedom and that academics can't say whatever they want makes him a bit hard to comprehend. Yes. Can you tell us how it manifests and, and what's different at Buckingham? Well, so, so it manifests, so let me give the, the, the different extremes. So, so one, on one level, many of my vice-chancellor uh, uh, contemporaries, they actually demand that the academic staff as it were, follow their dictacs. Mm -hmm. so, so, for example, it's very typical for university vice-chancellors to be saying now, academics must decolonize their curriculum. Now, what is this? It's a, it's a very strange word, but they're, 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 they're trying to make them uh, create curriculum which, you know, it, is, it doesn't offend certain groups, is very conscious of their, the whole identity politics idea, looking at equality, diversity, and inclusion over and above academic excellence even, vice-chancellors are instructing academic staff to do this. And that's one way in which we're different. Absolutely not. In fact, um, you know, my emphasis would be on the opposite, that actually we want, our, we want academic excellence, we want scholarship, and that probably doesn't mean eliminating, um, eliminating books or, or thinkers just because they're, let's say, stale, white and male, as, as the... As the uh, phrase goes. So that's on the one level. So it's actually dictated from above and it's very hard for anyone to resist that within the universities. Um, on the other extreme though, it's really, uh, you know, as an academic, you become aware of the sort of things you can and cannot research, of the ideas you can and cannot uh, claim, and of the speakers you can and cannot Invite you know invite to university. So there's a, the, the other extreme is to look at it. There's nothing happening. Um, it's just an academic doing his or her work, but he or she is doing it very constrained by. I know I'm not allowed to research that area. I know I'm not allowed to question that belief, and therefore they just work within a, 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 a you know a, a normalized structure which is not conducive to true academic pursuit, which is not about allowing people to pursue ideas and thoughts wherever they lead based on argument and evidence rather than on what is restricted and allowed within the sort of a acad academic life. So those are the two extremes. And everything between those that were, you know, there'd be famous examples. Well, one I know has been on your program, uh, Professor Eric Kaufman. Yeah. So he, rather like Professor Roger Scruton years before, um, was at Birkbeck College, Fine, fine college, I'm sure. But he was exploring, he was researching ideas on, on, uh, on white eth ethnicity and so on um, that his colleagues found unpalatable. And the sense was he was feeling uncomfortable there, increasingly uncomfortable. And so he came to the University of Buckingham to, uh, we, we, we brought him there. He can now explore his ideas as he wishes, based on argument and evidence. Um, and that, that is, so, so, so his example is someone who was actually made to feel uncomfortable. The, the worst case probably was Professor Kathleen Stock, yeah. the University of St Sussex. She was actually, in a sense, pushed out, driven out for her, what, you know, our very innocuous, what they call gender critical views, innocuous views that uh, uh, about uh, uh, trans and, uh, uh, and other uh, identities. You know, it was totally innocuous what she was saying. In fact, she was a very good analytical philosopher, wrote a very good book um, in the analytical philosophy tradition, philosophical tradition, chased out of her university. That's an extreme case, but nonetheless, even at the least extreme case, cases, it is people just feeling unable to pursue work because they'll be afraid of being disciplined, um, released, um, 
if they, if they say what they really believe. Mm. It's quite shocking, really. And I've been in the university sector for you know, most of my adult life, working life, and uh, I'm very much aware of the, the restraints, the constraints on, on you, um, what you can and cannot research. And it's been increasing over the years, but even 20 odd years ago, I wrote a book about feminism. Um, nearly got me cancelled, even mm. back, back then, yeah. I know now Professor Kaufman has joined you. He's doing yes. his course on wokeness. Yes. Why is it important to have this kind of countercultural teaching and research? Well, I mean, first of all, it's important because, as as a, a genuine academic, we believe in pursuing truth. We believe in pursuing arguments, as I said, where evidence, uh, where evidence leads, and where the logic of your argument leads, and the whole point of wokeness, to use that abbreviation, um, is to constrain thought. It's to make us think only in terms of different identities as being uh, different identities linked to, to power as being the only ways in which the world is conceived and, and, and operates. And that's restricting so many people from exploring other ways of knowing, other ways of seeing. Um, and, and so for someone like Professor Eric Kaufman to come to our university, well, absolutely clear, his work is valuable, it's valid as, as academic work, and it's a very powerful, I mean, you use that word counter, you know, absolutely you need counters to a uniform um, orthodoxy. Um, that's not the way, that's not how knowledge grows, that's not how knowledge works, you know, you absolutely need to be able to challenge orthodoxies and come up with new ideas and, you know, to to bring new ideas where that to embrace them wherever they lead. I mean, university was traditionally seen as this chance to finally leave home and go away and rebrand yourself and come back with a, a broader mind and a more as a more informed person. I think a lot of people now feel university is kind of doing the opposite and capturing young minds. I mean, what are your yes. thoughts on this and what can we yeah. do? I mean, there, there's some there's some very depressing data on this. Um, Research data. I mean, Eric Kaufman looks at similar things as well. And um, but research data from organisations like HEPI, the Higher Education Policy Institute, show that quite a substantial majority of young people are somewhat in favour of cancel culture. Mm -hmm. They're somewhat in favour of cancelling, um, you know, speaker if they disagree with your views. So, so young people, you know. They've come through the schooling system. They, they, they're, you know, Hollywood is very much bringing a sort of uh, often a woke agenda into people's lives, and so they and, and you know they are they're perhaps very conservative in that small c way um, and don't want to be challenged. But you know what I say in my the matriculation speeches I give when students arrive in Buckingham is this is not a safe place. This is a place where you can have ideas that trouble you, that, that challenge you. Um, this is a safe place for debate, but not to avoid debate. And it's a really important distinction. And you know, there are very few vice chancellors, I think, who stand up and say that. You know. um, now, there are a few, and that's great. Um, and so I'm, I don't want to claim too much originality here. Um, but nonetheless, there is a sense in which um, we, you know, we have to sort of just make too much allowances for students who are um, feeling uncomfortable. No, we've got to embrace ideas and, you know, we can shock if we want and we can challenge. And uh, there absolutely must not be trigger warnings about anything apart from this is going to be an idea that you'll want to explore. You know, I want people to be challenged in, as students in the university, yeah. I think um, some people now may feel that you know young people are lost to identity politics and our institutions have been captured. Yes. You're obviously kind of pushing forward in the other direction. And what would you say to those people to you know, g them up? Yes. So, so I, I very much believe in the marketplace of ideas, and you know I I get you know my feeling is that many parents of students particularly, but also students, in that those institutions that are captured, which just have the one line of thought. Remember, I'm happy to have all different thoughts, lines of thoughts, but just have the one approach to knowledge, the one approach to understanding. 
I get the, I would love them to say, well, actually, I'm fed up with that. I want to be able to think as, you know, to freely think, to explore ideas where they lead. Maybe I can come to Buckingham, you know. That's the, the you know, so I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm completely shameless about this, that actually we are a better place than other universities because we do allow the free, free sharing of ideas. Um, but also it's, it would be good if other, other universities are recognising that universities like us exist and that we're not ashamed or afraid to say we believe in freedom, um, free speech, academic freedom, other freedoms. And maybe that can encourage other universities also to, to say, oh, maybe we can be, or other academics within universities, yes, we can do. Um, we, we, can, we don't have to be frightened of academic freedom because other universities are doing it. And I'd like to see other, other new universities emerge like Buckingham here and overseas. There are some, as you know, happening in America. Um, it would be great to see a revival of universities that really are concerned with um, academic excellence, knowledge, not getting caught up in these political, um, this political nonsense, you know, of identity politics and so on. You know. And moving on to an, another passion of yours and something yes. I know you've won several awards for, which is yes. low-cost private education. Yes. So you went to some of the most dangerous and poorest places in the world to research this. And so what did you see there and yeah. how did it change your yeah. thinking? And, and the link with the work I'm doing now, so it's, if I can just make that link, um, so obviously we are a proudly independent private university at Buckingham and there, the work I've been doing around the world has been looking at affordable, low-cost private education. Ideally, I want to see that there are some ways of reducing the cost of higher education too and, and starting in Buckingham. But the point of being in Buckingham, I'm embracing ideas on freedom. I've been working for the last 20 years or more around the developing world, seeing how ideas on educational freedom work even in the poorest slums. So this is, that's, that's a sort of connection. It's, it's, it's not completely tenuous, but nonetheless, there is a connection. Yeah, I mean, this, this work has been com very absorbing. I, I have a passion for it. And I'm still doing a little bit of this work now through, through proxies, through other people, you know, who I've managed to get working. But yeah, some of the poorest, the poorest slums on, in, on this planet the, the, the slums of Lagos in Nigeria, the slums of Monrovia in Liberia. I've been working in those places and finding this. It was, a, it was research that found the majority of children in these poorest slums on this planet are attending private schools. Really? Yeah. The, and it's quite sort of surprising when people hear about it, even though I've been talking about it for a long time and there are now many researchers working in this field. It was a, you know, 20 years ago when I first brought this to the world's attention and eventually won some of those prizes. Um, it was just, well, we've never heard of that. Um, but, you know, now enough people have been into the slums and realised what's happening. And what's going on is poor parents, I mean, what I say is it's as natural to want to educate your children as it is to want to feed and clothe and house your children. It's a natural impulse that all parents have. Poor parents have that impulse. The government schools are either not available or they are of mediocre quality. Um, and so the poor are not willing to acquiesce in that mediocrity, but they instead encourage entrepreneurs within their communities to create schools that are affordable even for parents on the poverty line, the, the recognised poverty line. And so they are sending their children en masse. This is a phenomenon that keeps growing. The government schools decline in, in both in quality and then in uh, popularity. The private schools grow. And when we say low cost, what, what sort of fees are we talking about? Could be 100 to 150 pounds per year, right. that sort of thing. Well, obviously this is, well, a low-cost environment, so it's not quite as great, great it seems, but it might be 10 to 20 percent of a family's income yeah. um, or expenditure. Usually the same thing if you're, if you're poor. Um, so it's, it's been an extraordinary adventure for me to, first of all, find this phenomenon, then to document it thoroughly, do thorough research on it, to compare how children are in the low-cost schools to how private schools to the, how they are in the government schools 
and typically the research shows they perform much better in the low-cost schools than in the private uh, than in the government schools, and um, and then to look at the business models of these schools, and recognise that in development circles, what everyone's looking for is sustainability and scalability. They're already scalable because they there are hundreds of thousands of these low-cost private schools serving a majority, as I said, 70, 75, 80, 85 percent of poor kids go to these private schools. Um, so they're scalable and they are sustainable because typically, not always, but typically they're run as uh, businesses, small businesses, and so fully dependent on parental fees and therefore not dependent on government or subsidies or philanthropy in order to survive. Now obviously philanthropy can help, can help make them even more accessible, can help improve their facilities, but these schools are not dependent on that. Mm -hmm. So there's an extraordinary success story uh, um, that is embracing private enterprise, free enterprise, educational freedom to a large extent, educational entrepreneurialism that is creating a huge alternative to government education. And I think, um, well, it probably has exciting implications for us in England and America too. Why do the children in those schools perform better? Yes, so, so this is, you know, it's the million dollar question, it's a 64 million dollar question, whatever the phrase is. Um, but I, I think you, it's quite hard to pinpoint it in terms of research, but there is a hidden something, it's an X factor for private schools, is probably accountability. Right that um, in the government schools, if you, the teacher doesn't turn up or the teacher's drunk or whatever, he or she can't be removed. And the, the unions are so strong in the government schools, the teacher stays and stays there to you know, not be present, not teach properly, and everyone suffers. If the same thing happens in the private school, obviously the, the private proprietor can make, you know, make sure there's, uh, make allowances for a sudden death in the family, whatever, but generally, the teacher will get fired eventually, removed, you know, as happens in any other business. And so the teachers are accountable to the authorities, to the entrepreneur, in a way they're not in the government school. And then the same thing with parents, you know, I as a poor parent pay my fees to the school. I'm poor, so that money is a very important part of it. It's not something I can just willy-nilly throw around. And so I demand that the school is teaching my children I demand that the standards are high, and I, I maybe use various proxy measures for that. So, for example, I'd certainly as a poor parent, you talk to the children, the, and the child will say, my teacher wasn't present today, you know, to immediately know that. Or, you know English, and typically in the countries I'm working in, I've been working in, English is very, very important as the language of social mobility. As a parent, a poor parent, you may not speak English yourself, but you can listen to the children from school your, your child is at, they're speaking very good English compared to, the, or not very good English compared to that, those group of children are there who go to a different school, they're speaking very good English, so you know something is amiss and you want to, um, and, and you'll follow up with the school, or indeed move your child to another school. The schools have, you know, very small margins, so they are very conscious that parents can move around like this, and so they will um, make sure standards are high within their schools. So it's the way the market mechanism works in most other fields. It, and there's lots of uh, competition in these schools. So it's not as if there's one school in Lagos. No, in this slum alone, there might be 30 low-cost private schools. And they compete with each other. So you, there's an easy, there is an easy access to other schools if you feel your school is not doing well. The, the proprietors know that, so make sure you stay at that school. Accountability is the key, I believe, yeah. So it's kind of the free market that makes this work. Yes. Someone founds a school because they can make a profit, but they need to keep the quality high because yes. of the competition. Yes, exactly. Um, it, it's, it's just pure free market principles. They do work in terms of schooling. And when you say they make a profit, you know, they make enough to feed themselves and their family. There's no sense of profiteering because they did profiteer. The other schools are available, and we'll just you know and take children away from them. That's as, as simple as that, really. Yeah. The mindset in Britain is generally that private schools are this elitist thing that's for the yes. rich people. Yes. Do you think that works to the detriment of parents and children here? Yes, I definitely believe it does. And uh, um, 
a while back. So I said, you know, I left to the, as hanging. I think it's got implications for England and America. Um, a while back, I, I stopped traveling, you know, you know, four or five years, five, six years ago. And, but how, you know, it was in those days just a sort of one trick pony. It was just focused on low cost private education. So I actually thought, is it possible to create something similar in England? I was at Newcastle University at the time. So we did create a low cost private school or an affordable private school in Durham near, near Newcastle. Now, of course, this is not low cost like the schools I've told you about, but the fees have settled around three and a half thousand pounds per year. OK, I think what that means, um, that's that's three fifths of the per capita funding in the state schools. Right. So it's lower than the funding there. It's one fifth of the funding in the nearest private schools so it's it is very low cost comparatively although of course you know the fees might seem high relatively and at that level we have now we're passing our we've passed our Ofsted inspections you know the government regulator compulsory regulation uh, inspection we have grown from um, uh, uh, reception class up to uh, GCSE the, the school leaving exams at age 16 and um, and the school is now making a small, very small, but nonetheless making a very small surplus. So in other words, we have proven that you can have a low cost private school model here and you can do it at a fee that most people think is impossible. Mm -hmm. And no, obviously I, I'm involved as uh, the vice chancellor at the University of Buckingham now, so I'm, I'm chairman of the board there. I'm not involved on a day to day level. But nonetheless, I think it's a very exciting model that could be that could be replicated elsewhere. I want it to be replicated elsewhere because increasingly this will show we don't have to have state education. We don't have to have government involved in education in order to deliver something that is high quality, of great value to parents. And in a school like that, doesn't have to get caught up in the woke agenda either, very importantly. And parents will love that, you know. Parents will love that. There are regulations. But nonetheless, as a, as a private school in Durham, we, we don't go over the top about following them as, they might, them, uh, as other school, schools might do in the same area. So it's, it's very important, this whole idea of separating yourself from government and you can really avoid, to a large extent, the woke agenda in schools. And I'm hoping at the uh, university level too. Is this something you can see being rolled out across the country? I mean, what's, what's stopping it from emulating? Yeah, so uh, I suppose it's the same question as, so where did this phenomenon come from in Nigeria, India, uh, and so on? It must have been that there were the first entrepreneurs who realized that there was a demand for schooling and they could start something. So my, my guess is it was simultaneously involved in these different places. That it, you know, but there were one, two, five, ten, but a small number of entrepreneurs created schools and then others saw that this were possible to do and it's actually quite a nice small business to keep your family, to keep your, you know, have a nice status in the community and so on. But you, um, uh, so it needed that first entrepreneur. Yeah. First set of entrepreneurs. And in a way, that's what myself and my business partner up north have been. We've done it now. We, are, we have got quite a few people coming to see us and saying, oh, we might try something similar. Mm. Probably not the same price point because there's a lot of room between 3,000 and 20,000. You know, there's a lot of, you know, you can have, you can have a, much, a higher price point but still be affordable. Yeah. Um, and I'm very hopeful we'll see several of these schools and then you start seeing change of these schools emerging and it becomes a viable challenge to the state sector. That's the key thing. It becomes a viable challenge and, and allows the sort of freedom we're talking about. The, again, the curriculum or whatever does not have to be distorted in the way that it, it is within the state sector. Because you asked me, your, your question was, um, the fact that private schools are so expensive, is it harmful? And I think it very much is, because it excludes the vast majority of the population. You know, private schools, for whatever reason, have, you know, they've, they, they, they see there's been this sort of um, fees 
you know, arms race, isn't the arms race to create the best theatre, the best, you know, Olympic style, Olympic size swimming pool, the best, you know, uh, all weather football fields and all the rest of it, rather than just saying, well, actually, education is important. It's not expensive to deliver educa good education. We don't need all the fripperies that other places have. Mm. And, but the schools are pursuing those fripperies and therefore excluding most parents. It's only the top, is it the top decile can afford private schools in yeah. this country? Certainly the top quintile, yeah. It's whatever it is, it's, n it's not most parents. It's just a, a cultural thing, isn't it? That, that's why it's so unusual to hear about what you were saying about the, the, the poorest places have got private schools to yeah. a British person. It's like, yeah. really? No, it, 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 it was very strange. And, and to be fair, it, it's, you know, a lot of my life's work was talking to people um, who say, I, don't be you know, I can't believe that because it's so outside of the box, um, even within the countries themselves. So you've got to realise that, you know, um, people who live in the posher parts of Lagos on VI or Ikoi or whatever, or it, the posh parts of Nairobi, and you know they don't go to the poorest slums, mm -hmm. and so they will just have a, an impression of oh the poor dirty you know um, not doing very much, and they will them be, some, themselves be surprised to hear there are all these private schools. Um, so I've you know I've been. I've had some f quite fun experiences where I've taken people from the posh parts of Lagos, for instance. I said, come and see for yourself. And they've mm. come across and said, this is unbelievable. You've opened my eyes to something I did not believe was possible. And it's happening, as it were, almost under our noses um, in, in the, the slums. We didn't realize it was going on. Now we realize, we realize that there's, a, there's something very special going on here. James Soley, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.